And uh, it's another um, uh, uh, grayish, little bit slightly cold day in Manhattan, in Midtown. And um, we are marching on with our series. It's this edition number 147. And um, we are continuing our talks through the time of Corona. And now uh, we are slowly, hopefully, leaving it. We entered it in March last year, spoke to so many artists from all around the world. And we get an update on uh, what's on their minds, uh, what theater means to them and how theater helped them to create meaning in life and how it helped us also through, through um, their work. And we have um, a very special um, day today, I think, um, for everybody who followed um, our talks um, knows that um, we have put a strong focus on great theater artists uh, from around the world, from the US, but also on the idea of the theater of the real and also on theater artists who have a long experience who can look back over decades. And luckily today uh, we have with us Emily Mann who is all of that. And um, she's a great, great uh, uh, worker in the field of theater, has influenced so many lives, has really created an outstanding body of work and with us, to honor it in a right way, we have Carol Martin, who uh, all our listeners know so very well. Um, and Carol is um, with us again. She is the one who mapped that field, uh, the theater of the real, um, out. And um, so we will be all three of us in conversation. Carol will give a little introduction for all of those who do not know enough about Emily Mann. We also have many international listeners. There would be no need to introduce here her here in the US, but for our international listeners, Emily is an award-winning playwright and director and an artistic director. And she served for 30 years, three decades as the artistic director and resident playwright of the MacArthur Theater, the great MacArthur Theater in Princeton, um, in New Jersey, just an hour away from uh, 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 Midtown Manhattan, if you, don't get the right subway to Brooklyn and uh, the train stop. It might take you the same time um, to get uh, to the MacArthur's Theater. And I have done it often. And uh, she has won so many awards, Tony's, and she has also made very, very significant uh, production on Broadway. Um, often, you know, it is very hard to have your own work, your experimental work, and also be representative on Broadway and to get away with it. Um, and she really uh, did that. This is a streetcar named Desire. The, famous and significant Anna in the Tropics, which she um, developed an Ilo Kuspe that got also the uh, Pulitzer execution of justice hanging, having our say. And so many, many others, Greensboro, Mr. Uh, uh, Packard, and I cannot tell them all, uh, scenes from a marriage, Uncle Vanya, uh, the Cherry Orchard, a seagull in the Hamptons, um, the house of Bernada Alba was a very successful production, Antigone, and so many, many, many other things. She got her Tonys, but also she is included in the American Theatre Hall of Fame. It's a very big deal, it's very important, but her heart, I think, is with the theatre we all care about. And this is quite an achievement to be able to move in all these worlds. Carol, as you all know, is a professor of drama at Tisch School of the Arts and uh, affiliated with, of course, NYU and Abu Dhabi, uh, uh, the little, uh, how would one say, downtown uh, Whitney, downtown uh, NYU in Abu Dhabi. Um, she uh, is an expert on the theater of the real and uh, the dramaturgy of the real on the world stages. That's her great uh, book is about. And she really writes about French theater, Israeli theater, Japanese theater, and, um, and uh, her book series in performance from the Seagull book is something we really uh, uh, should uh, all follow even more um, in French. I mean, it's translated in French. Uh, I'm sure she also follows a French uh, theater. She guest edits for the great TDR, this important uh, magazine. And she just wrote something about uh, Toshiki Okada, the great Japanese uh, director she supported early on and understood his significant contribution to global um, theater and um, so and she has also got so numerous fellowships and she's a speaker around the world. So it's a big, big um, honor to have her um, with us here. And now again, I talked way too much. And uh, let's go to our guests. And uh, first of all, Emily, where are you? And what time is it? And uh, Well, it is noon okay. in Princeton, New Jersey. So I'm still in Princeton though. I stepped down from a Carter a year ago. Uh, July 1st of, of, of this past year. 
My goodness. Yeah. That must have been incredible. A 30 year work, which yes. is a big change in life. So you're yes. losing a, a part of your life, your work, a place so being set in such a way. And then Corona comes in. Yes, it was a very strange confluence and wonderful, actually, in that uh, I spent the last five months from March until July uh, running the theater via Zoom uh, and from home. And so it helped me break the 30 year habit of grabbing a cup of coffee, jumping in my car and driving to the theater till dinner or midnight, whatever was going on. Uh, so it helped me make the transition in a strange way to being um, working from home again and being a freelance artist again, which I'm ending up adoring. And I've had, I all feel almost guilty to say it because I'm also so aware of my good fortune and luck um, with all the misery that this year has caused. Um, for me, it was the most creative one of my life and decades so really so yeah. tell us a bit about the moment when corona happened where were you what were you doing well i was actually um a bit uh uh clueless and unconscious i had taken a group of major donors from the mccarter theater to london as i often did um to see plays and to talk about them and we were in London last week of February, first few days of March, hearing something about this mysterious virus, not realizing how serious it was um, in a theater, uh, often a large theater every night. Um, and we got home, found out how serious this was. And um, within, 10 days of returning, we had to close McCarter, as did all the American theaters, Broadway and the rest of the theaters around the country had to shutter by, I think about March 16th. Um, so we were, we dodged many bullets while we were there. As a matter of fact, I, I told you earlier that we had seen Tom Stoppard's new play, which we uh, very much admired. And then Tom was in the audience behind us uh, watching a play the next night and a friend of mine who had worked with him said he got it as did most of that cast so Incredible. we were extremely fortunate we, we were, were lucky and I'm sure the uh, board of the Bricada was very nervous when they heard you took all the donors to London in the time of corona <laughs> what yes. were you thinking I uh, know <laughs> in March uh, incredible um, but it, uh, that's a miraculous and it was miraculous the, that we of theater were with you as they yes. should be um, so Carol, um, you are surveying um, the theater scene um, from your work uh, as a researcher, as a writer, uh, also as a lover of theater. Um, where does Emily fit in? Why are you interested in her work? Um, well, Emily fits in many places, <laughs> many different kinds of places, um, from off Broadway to Broadway to she's clearly both a director and a playwright. And I first um, uh, was introduced to Emily's work in relationship to the, the idea of documentary theater and her incredible um, book, Testimonies for Plays by Emily Mann, which I'll hold up here. And, um, and, and the kind of track record that Emily, that you have Emily, from the early play Anula Allen, which I saw off Broadway a while ago, um, actually written in 1977 or first produced in 77. Mm -hmm. The title is The Autobiography of a Survivor and it's about a Holocaust survivor. Um, and, and I think this play really anticipated an explosion of, of documentary theater in the US in very different kinds of forms and um, also Still Life, which is 1979, about the Vietnam War's impact on domestic lives. And in this particular play, Emily interviewed a, a Vietnam War vet, his wife and his girlfriend. And it's really a, um, and it's a graphic play, I would say, about the domestic violence um, that ensues um, from veterans bringing the war back home 
Um, it's very moving, it's very challenging uh, in terms of its domestic violence. And then there are these, you know, execution of justice, uh, which looks at the murder of Harvey Milk, um, who was the first openly gay person elected to uh, the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco. And um, it's an incredible play, but also and kind of my favorite play that Emily has written um, of, of this kind of work is Greensboro, a Requiem, oh. 1995. And it's about the murder of five anti-Ku Klux Klan demonstrators during a march in North Carolina. So um, the Klansmen and neo-Nazis were brought to trial three times. And Emily really documents what happened over those three trials and you know if you know in one sense um emily builds her own complex case that who these people are and what they believe in is the actual situational uh kind of social political context of the murders and and portrays you know a part of a, a portion of a certain American sensibility. It's actually still post-Civil War. It's strangely um, uh, not what we imagine the, the country to be in certain ways. So um, yeah, it's an extraordinary body of work. And, um, and it's a body of work that um, it holds a mirror up to nature, holds a mirror up to ourselves in terms of lets us see ourselves from a new vantage point through these four very different kinds of situations um, in American history. So that's how I first you know, got introduced and interested in Emily's work. Yeah. Thank you, Carol. I love that Greensboro is your favorite play because it's my most forgotten child. Oh. You know, mm -hmm. It has never had uh, uh, the kind of um, life that the others have, um, perhaps because it, you know, it premiered in in um, in Princeton, and then it didn't um, go on. And it's a large cast now. It has a great life again because it's so much about white supremacy and that's exactly. what people are discussing. And so there have been many community readings, both in Greensboro where it happened, and TBS followed that, um, and then. Um, on college campuses or in community groups, people will sit around and they read it, which has made an, another life for it, which gives me great, uh, great happiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perhaps. You know, how do you tie, is there any way that you're thinking about some of the issues in Greensboro to more contemporary events, the uh, demonstrations um, that we all experienced last summer, the protests? No question about it. Um, um, the rise of neo-Nazism and, uh, and uh, the white supremacist movements. Um, some are no longer called Klan, KKK. There are lots of different names of it, but the rise of white supremacist movements was sort of enabled um, and encouraged and uh, by uh, the last uh, presidential um, reign and um, as the you know the the Southern Poverty Law Center said, there has been a huge spike in um, hate crimes and um, racist, anti-Semitic, and anti-Black uh, and anti-immigrant crimes. And so, the play Greensboro was talking about another time when that surge was happening in the late seventies, where the Klan was getting larger and larger again. And the, the point is, as you made earlier, it's it's the ethos of American culture. Um, that never quite came to terms um, with the uh, end of the loss in the Civil War. And um, that culture still pervades in different forms. Uh, and whether it was shown again during Jim Crow, um, we know that's true. There was a little seeming lull, but it was still just silenced. And now we're as some people are saying in Jim Crow 2.0. Um, so th there's a lot of what's happening at this moment in time in our country that Greensboro 
uh, talks about both the history of it and the present. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the things that is so admirable in, in Greensboro in particular, but in all the plays, is that you're, you're um, not afraid to include and interview the quote unquote, the other side. So for Greensboro, remarkably, you interviewed um, David Duke, yeah. who, is the, who was the former Grand Dragon of the Klan, mm -hmm. former president of the National Association for the Advancement of White People, um, and included his, uh, his thoughts. But also there in the third trial um, that's represented in the play, where Lewis Pitts, lawyer, interviews Roland Wayne Wood on the witness stand, right? And um, when Pitts asks Wood if he's proud to be a racist, Wood responds, quote, yes, sir. I believe in the sovereign right of the sovereign people of the sovereign states of the Confederacy that has never surrendered. That's right. There you have the it. Traitor surrendered, but not the Confederate government. I believe my country is occupied and I will fight as my forefathers fought to give me a free Christian Republic. I mean, these ideas are, you know, they never went away. Never. They're, you know, but they're reemergent today. Um, so it's, it's a very, prescient play um thank you yeah yeah it, i i would love to see it done again right at this moment um i have never been so afraid for our democracy certainly during my lifetime but when i read our history as a country um i don't think except for um pre-Civil War times and Civil War times, I don't think we've ever been more at risk. Um, and even then there was, you know, the secessionists um, were seen as, as treasonous and there was a war over it. We now have um, treason right from within, within our Congress. Um, and also um, in the state legislatures uh, around the country and, and on the ground with the people. And so I do see a possible loss of democracy because it looks as if autocracy may come into play, um, but also the racial strife, the hatred, the splintering of the country. I don't think has ever been this severe except then. So I'm, I'm looking at 2022 even more than 24. I don't know about you, as being crucial mm -hmm. the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and um, I once was. I think I went to Ellis Island to the uh, Great Exhibition, and there were photos, and it was a big Ku Klux Klan demonstration, actually in Long Branch, in New Jersey, at the Jersey Shore. They were marching, and that's. I, you know, we. I was always thinking, well, it's something in the south, but as you both point out, this is a deeply rooted American system, and you. Um, anticipated and the future, but also you took a, a temperature of, of the moment. Why did you say, I'm going to write my own place, I'll do these interviews, even though it was not such a well-known practice, and as Carol said, you were pioneering this, why not just taking the classes, the Chekhovs and the Tennessee Williams you also did and others, why did you feel you had to um, create theater in this way, what Carol calls the theater of the real? I think perhaps because I'm the daughter of an historian um, and um, often I had big ideas that I wanted to get out there. And I think he admired the real and nonfiction and the historical record more than fiction. Mm -hmm. And certainly the fevered imagination of his uh, then young daughter. And I wanted to prove things to him. Um, that's the best I can do. All I know is that one day I was looking for a new play. I wanted to direct a new play. And the new plays that I was reading were always, there was a period in the 70s and early 80s when everything seemed to be 
um, in in sort of um, in kitchens, but talking about more more it, it was um, lower middle class white ethnics talking about um, you know relationships, and I found that you know mildly interesting. I liked. I liked, uh, often they were very violent and I would thought, thought, well, they were fun to direct, but I wanted to direct something that, that was about ideas. And I happened to be, I was in college at the time and my father had been made head of the American um, Jewish Committee's uh, oral history project uh, on Holocaust survivors. And uh, Carol mentioned my first play, Anula, um, an autobiography of a survivor. and. I opened a folder on his desk and there was an interview between a mother and a daughter on the Upper West Side in New York. And um, the daughter asked her mother, you know, she said, finally, we have an excuse to talk. You would never talk to me about what happened. And I want to know how you survived. And her mother, um, who had been a ballerina in the uh, National Ballet of Prague, said she was, um, in the camp on a bunk bed um, along with all the other people in utter misery. And she said how she kept alive is that she would close her eyes and she would picture a moment of perfect beauty. And she saw herself on point in a pool of light with her partner in her tutu and, um, and, and just picturing a perfect turn. And she said she did that over and over and she was sure that's how she survived. And I was just, you know, crying. I thought it was remarkably beautiful. And I asked my father if I could turn it into a one act play, a mother daughter play. And he said, no, he said it belongs in the archives of the American <laughs> Jewish committee. I'm dying to find that play, um, that, that interview. And he said, um, but I think you should do your own. And the next day I came down for breakfast and he bought me a tape recorder and he said, go out and do your own. And that started me on my journey. And the first play, as Carol mentioned, was Anula. And I went to um, Europe with my college roommate and interviewed her aunt who had survived. And also then went to my grandmother's village in Poland. And only she and her sister survived of this huge family because um, they had come earlier to the United States. And, and um, documented that as well. So um, that started me. Um, and then I realized that even more than what I could make up, I was, I was always just astonished by the beauty of how sp people speak when I was able to um, uh, in some ways make a poetry out of um, uh, out of uh, the, the, the language of real people. Um, I would boil it down to a kind of stage poetry and muscularity of poetry. And, um, and I was always surprised by what actually happened, that there was something to be learned if you, so often it, it goes against what you are taught and how to, to construct um, a well-made play but if you have to, if you give yourself, and I was very strict with myself, I never changed the facts. Mm -hmm. And so I had to wrestle with what actually happened even when they were inconvenient truths. And by doing that is constantly um, making more complex uh, the story. And that's, I think, why they may last because there's no, everyone's right and everyone's wrong. People are complex situations are complex. Um, and, um, and when I found that I was astonished by something, I would share that with the audience. And I would find that that would often astonish others. And that's, that was sort of my rule of thumb. And I just could not stop doing it. It's very hard work, I have to say, when I've had the chance to sit down just right out of my imagination, it feels so easy. Not to say that my great, the great uh, 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 playwrights who, who write strictly from their imaginations are not working hard, they're working very hard, but um, this was a different form where I had to find a way to make theatrical the mess of real life. And um, 
It was a fascinating, fascinating journey. So, you know, in, in a certain sense, it's the same in the kind of writing I do, um, or it can be the same in that one doesn't want to just pursue a singular idea and leave out all the other stuff that contradicts your idea. And, um, and that's where it becomes really interesting and really challenging. But could you, could you give some examples of, of inconvenient truths that you encountered in, while trying to write some of your plays? Stuff? Well, in Greensboro, uh, in the Greensboro. survivors, mm -hmm. uh, they had gone down the path of, you know, they, they started out as good liberal union organizers. Uh, anti-racist workers um, wanting uh, to work arm in arm with um, this was a, a lot of them were um, northerners, northeasterners, um, and were dedicated to justice in the south. And um, their Maoism was a problem, which they later um, none of them are Maoists now. Let's put it that way. Um, they made a mistake of also using inflammatory rhetoric. Um, they went marching around for their anti-Klan demonstration with signs of death to the Klan. Well, those fellows took umbrage at that, say, you want to kill us? We'll kill you. And they came armed. Um, so I embraced that and I, I talked to the survivors whom I became very, very fond of, and I, I, I very much um, admire, and I admire their I, early idealism and continued idealism and their, and their uh, sense of, of social justice, um, and said, well, where are you on this now? And rather than try to get around it, I heard them critique themselves. I, I encouraged them to say, well, what did you looking back now, not to blame the victim or anything, but what would you have done differently now? What do you think now? And um, I got an outpouring of such interesting information of how they began to rethink themselves politically and yet they are still all engaged in a new way to affect change. So for example, Nelson Johnson who becoming a Maoist and had been a student activist in, in, in his youth before he joined this group, um, realized in the black community, the way to affect change was through the church. And so he's a minister for a poor people's church. He continues the struggle. He does so much work in Greensboro and beyond, um, but he found his way that way. Um, Paul Bermanson, as he said, I guess I'm just a liberal guy. <laughs> He does his own anti-racist work um, from New York City. He was one of the survivors, but he was severely injured. Um, and he and his wife, Sally, do a lot of work um, with Native Americans. And, and uh, Sally has found out that she's part Native American and she's done um, her kind of work in that. And they do a lot of work uh, um, in a different way, but they found their way and this shock to their systems they could have just given up and become apolitically and, apolitical and gone quiet, but they didn't. And that to me was very interesting as well. But when you talk about the, um, the press at that time, um, it, their uh, affiliation as Maoists made it easy for the press to say two extremist groups fought it out. Whereas in fact, though they were, um, I think Maoism is, a, in a, is an extreme uh, position, <laughs> um, though uh, they were just, they had just the day before decided to join the Maoist party. Um, they, um, they learned from uh, what happened to them. Uh, and though some of them ended up being paralyzed by grief, um, others picked themselves up and went forward. So I, 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 the inconvenient truth was when they were called communists, often that was a term used in the South for any um, people who were uh, working for civil rights and especially rights for, for black people. This time it was true, they were. That was an inconvenient truth that I had to wrestle with. 
That's great. That's great. So are you, um, so what, what are you working on now and how does, how does this formidable past work figure into what you're thinking about now? Oh, that's interesting. I, I have been, um, commissioned by uh, three wonderful producers, Michael Wolk, Kumiko, Kumiko Yoshi, mm -hmm. and Robin De La Vita, uh, to write the stage adaptation of The Pianist, which is uh, Baruch yes. Spielmann's um, uh, memoir. So it's not on the Polanski film, but on the actual memoir. And I've been working on it um, for uh, three years now. And, um, and during the pandemic did a Zoom, directed a Zoom reading of it, of my new draft. And we're going to go forward, hopefully this coming season in the spring. And that clearly, I feel like I've come full circle with Anula, you know? And in fact, what's funny is Michael went to graduate school with me in University of, uh, University of Minnesota. And I was uh, on the Bush Fellowship with the Guthrie and, and, and the university. And he remembered uh, Anula at Guthrie too, my first play. Hmm. I mean, it, I mean, I hadn't spoken to him. It would have been 1979, you know, what is that, 40 years? And he said, that play has always stuck with me. And I thought you'd be the perfect writer for this. I don't want my God. Oh my God. <laughs> Incredible. You probably haven't kept up with me, but I'm a Broadway producer now, but I've kept up with you. And I think that this would be great mm. for you. So my first instinct was, oh my God, I can't do another Holocaust story. Um, but then my husband looked at me and said, you know, every time you say you're not gonna do something and you resist a story is when you end up doing it. So mm. in fact, after reading the memoir, which I had never read and knowing it wasn't going to be based on the movie, I said, yes. And I said, but I do have to go to Poland. I have to go to Warsaw. I have to walk those streets. I need to, I need, need to be there. And so they said, fine. Um, and also because I was going, I contacted a number of people who were part of the Jewish Museum, which is one of the greatest museums I have ever gone to anywhere in the world. Is that um, the Museum of the History of Polish Jews? That one, the new one, on the, the former Warsaw Ghetto? Yeah, I could have yeah. stayed there for uh -huh. a month. Um, and I contacted them and they said, well, you know, if you're, because uh, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather's family came from Warsaw. And I said, I, is there any way I could find their graves? Or is there any way I could find out about them? She said, absolutely. They made a family tree for me and then they gave me a guide through the Jewish cemetery in Warsaw. Um, which is one of the most fascinating places. It's a whole city of the dead. It's hundreds of years of, of uh, Jewish life in Warsaw. And I had no idea how, it was like New York for Jews. I mean, it was a place where people were the most free they'd been in Europe. And I'd always thought of Poland as a place where we all got killed. I didn't realize how it, things flourished at different points. Um, and, I found out I had a rabbi in the family. Of course, I'd been the grand rabbi at one point. Um, but also, they took me to my great grandmother's grave, and I put a stone on her grave, and it, it was life changing. And realized our knowledge of the family sort of stopped with, you know, little stories that the family would tell, but that we would never complete. And because of that's where everyone died. So you don't talk about it. We're having, we're in the, that's the old country, we're in the new country, we're going forward. And I've always wanted to go back. And um, he suddenly was, oh, you know, I, I, I too am a Warsaw Jew. So I was writing from a very personal place with the, um, with the piano story. And um, it's been a, a great, great uh um a great project for me it's it's opened me up in so many new ways and because the memoir did not have uh details on his family as much as one would hope to make a play i had to invent 
from little bits of, of uh, hints from the memoir, who those people were. So there's a lot of writing that I was able to do, which I love as well. Um, and then meld that with um, the voice of, of the pianist Spielmann himself. But it does hook up with so much of what else I do, because as you know, Carol, even probably more than Frank, that so many, I usually break the fourth wall in all my plays, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and he is speaking directly to the audience. It's a very intimate journey through his experience. Um, and um, th that has been wonderful. Again, working not from my own interviews with people, but from his, you know, his very personal account of what happened to him during the war. So I'm using all of those kinds of um, that skill set that I that I've been developing over so many years with the with the um, strict um, uh, documentaries. But this is still a theater of testimony piece. So Frank and I were together many many years. <clears throat> on a tour of Poland. Remember that? Yes, of course. Yes, I got to Glenda, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and that was one time, and Frank was having a particular experience from his youth, because uh, you'll have to tell that to us, Frank. But I later went back to Poland, and a friend of mine, Barbara Christian Black Gimblet. Is oh, Barbara was so helpful to me, yes. Oh, she's amazing. She's, and she's in New York, so. Um, <clears throat> this was before the museum was finished and I met her there and I had just seen film unfinished. I don't know if you've seen that extraordinary film and we met in the graveyard and then Barbara took me. So by the images of the film in my mind, we met in the graveyard, Barbara took me on a whole tour of the perimeter of what used to be the Warsaw ghetto, which is yeah. vast. And just the, the, the curvilinear shape of the museum was there, but it was still a museum of construction. But anyway, after this incredible day, there was a, a little party because a book called Apollonia, which is extraordinary, was just published in my series. But then I went back to the hotel and there was a naked man standing in the lobby. And I, I just kind of froze. And it was like, you know, I, a friend of mine who's a psychoanalyst, I said, I can't describe what happened to me in that moment. It was like my whole day came rushing at me and got embodied in this, literally, it was, there was a naked man in the hotel lobby. And my friend said, well, that's a classic example of the uncanny. So that was my, my Warsaw experience at that time, just full of these uh, yeah. Yeah, in, incredible things. But Frank, you had an experience when we went on that uh, Polish Cultural Council tour of Poland of your own youth. Yeah, it's true. It uh, did uh, reconnect me also in, in a very light way, of course, you know, that uh, things that were unspoken about in family and history. My father was uh, born in Silesia in Opole or Oppen at the time, actually the same year almost as Peter Schumann in the same town. That's why I feel also such a strong connection to him. Never talked about it, um, never went back to school after he was nine or 10 years old, was a displaced person, a refugee, people had to be up to the end of the world distributed, you know, in West Germany, actually with police and machine guns, because nobody wanted to take those seven, eight million Germans who are now displaced uh, in because Russia, Stalin took a part of Poland said, actually, this has already been has been Russian territory for some time ago. And um, so the big liberator took away stuff from Poland and then, you know, took apart from Germany at the time and that, you know, but actually that's your homeland. And there was an exchange. I'd never been, I'd always avoided it also. My father never talked to me about it. Uh, actually also when I asked him and um, so it was a very odd feeling, but I just cannot even, um, you know, compare to anything that um, Emily must have felt uh, walking through um, those um, those stones. And um, so Emily, a uh, question that uh, this idea of both theater of memory and working through uh, questions of, uh, you know, um, the societies have, we have as our families, our fathers, you actually 
Hannah Muller would say, you were on a mission. Your father gave you a mission. The father, the idea, you know, of uh, the old Hamlet's idea, the one who then is there and you have to do something. But um, did this, in this time of Corona, um, did that have an impact on you with all your incredible experience as a playwright, as a director, but also as an artistic director in over three decades? What happened for you? Well, um, I went inward, really. Um, and then when George Floyd was killed and the racial reckoning came again, um, this is where having been alive for quite a while comes in handy. Um, I was so thrilled to see, unlike the 60s, and, and I have to also preface this, that I grew up, uh, my father's best friend was John Hope Franklin, another great, great historian, who is really the founder of African-American studies in America. I mean, one of the great, great, great historians and, and like a second father to me. And, um, and so I've been studying black people and Jews all my life. Really, and and my father's field also was ethnic history, and he studied immigration. <clears throat> so he was talking about pluralism, you know, uh, pluralism and and diversity with different words um, from the time I was a little girl. So, so what's going on now is both familiar and and unfamiliar. Um, but when the r r reckoning happened, I realized two things. One, I was glad that I was no longer an artistic director, both because of the having to, you know, deal with the horror of of um, furloughing and um, people being out of work and and um, how to run a theater in a pandemic, but also because there was a new way that institutions, especially the theater, were going to have to look at themselves and make change. And because McCarter had always my core mission from the time I arrived was to support the work of women and people of color in particular. Um, I felt like I had done that in my institution for 30 years now, how could I be useful in the, in the larger conversation? So I just began to sit back and deeply listen to what our profession was talking about. And then when asked, I started to um, both consult and um, be an ally for those who I had forged deep relationships with over the last 30 and 40 years in the, in the community. And that's been both humbling and um, enriching and it's enlarged my thinking a great deal. Um, and I've enjoyed it. I'm also concerned about how the conversation is going, but I also have never been more optimistic that we're going to see change eventually for the good um, for all of us in these areas, for particularly um, those groups that have been left out of the conversation and out of the work for so long. Um, and we're going to fully see America on stage um, and backstage and in, in all of our workings in the, in the theater. Um, we, we will come out of this, I think, a stronger and more just um, profession and country, hopefully. Well, country, I'm not so sure. That's another conversation, but in the theater, I hope. Um, so I've spent a lot of time. I mean, there's another project I'm doing, which is you know, I'm the yin and the yang. Um, I'm writing a new musical, The Book of a Musical with Lucy Simon um, and Susan Birkenhead and Victoria Clark. And so we're having a fantastic time. In fact, we're in the third day of a workshop. I've, I've left the workshop to come join this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and we're having a marvelous time and it's a love story, um, but also taking place in a divided town, which is a stand in for a divided country. So um, can't seem to just write just a love story. I <laughs> tried, but can't do it. Um, but 
I was able to really go deep and be writing again, um, full-time writing again, but also thinking deeply about what I was able to accomplish with my goals of equity for women and people of color, and then where I couldn't go all the way and why, um, what is more systemic, what makes it harder than just say, well, just do it, right? Well, what kept, I, I, that's how I started, just do it. You know, why, what was the pushback and why? And getting deeper inside of that has been um, a great, a great set of lessons and I'm, I'm loving this very uh, difficult time. I find it extremely stimulating and challenging in, in a good way. Most days, some days I, I find it just too exhausting and upsetting, but most days I'm, I'm stimulated and optimistic about change. Yeah, I think it's, it, it's been um, important for me to find a handle some way or other so to not get depressed to not feel defeated and and that can be many different kinds of things it can be mentoring uh, mm -hmm. your colleagues in in writing um in, in it can be really working very very closely with students and getting them to to articulate ideas and be eloquent in their thinking and writing it can be um but but having that handle i i do feel also a little bit optimistic. I mean, the the protests were for uh, last summer were nicely integrated in terms of yes. and white people and Latinx people, um, Native Americans, and I thought that was remarkable. I think Anna Devere Smith also remarked on that. She said on a news program that she thought that was one sign of the success of our educational system, at least part of our educational system. Um, I also think, you know, at the moment we were calling for diversity, that there were already people who were, you know, able to step in. I'm seeing Black newscasters, commentators, writers, you know, journalists, that, that suddenly there's, you know, there, has, there is no pipeline issue, that the, the people right. are waiting to step in, right? Exactly so, right. So something has been a little bit right that we've you know, enabled that. I think that's right. Um, and I think we learned a lot of things from the last time. And one of them is allyship. That when the civil rights movement began to peter out is when, in my opinion, um, when black power became just too much the ethos of the time and um, Jews were thrown out of the civil rights movement, white people were thrown out of the civil rights movement, and people said, we're going to do it alone. I understand and, and did then and do to this day that, that feeling, but I think that um, a lot was learned by this generation saying, no, we need to be arm in arm. Um, and I think a lot of people were surprised, you know, in little towns in Colorado and you see a whole bunch of white people with Black Lives Matter signs walking through their town. You go, all right. I mean, that there is a sense that because we were all at home and we couldn't get away, and a lot of us were watching television more than we ever had. And there you could not take your eyes off the fact that one Black person after another was being murdered and you couldn't say, oh, what was this self-defense? Was that because the video cameras were on, whether it was someone taking it on their cell phone or it was on the police recorders and there was no turning away from it. There was no denying it anymore. It, it was a, a true reckoning. And I think there are more people in this country of, of good, will and and more people who believe in fairness than don't um, and began to look at the systems involved and began to look at history. I mean, we are a country unlike Europe, the European countries that seem to know their history in America. A lot of Americans have no, no historical um, background. I mean, I knew about Tulsa from the time I was a little girl because John Hope Franklin's father was in the massacre. So, I mean, I, he was studying this since, oh my God, for 50 
plus 60 years, um, but that the country knows about it now. Yes, yes, increasingly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I'm just finding this all very helpful and hopeful. Yeah, um, Emily, the country is changing. It has perhaps already changed. If you look at American theater, what was wrong, what is wrong, and what needs to change? if you would run the zoo, if you would run the circus? Well, I, I don't want to sound too ideological, but the, the truth is that the theater has been run by white men um, for the longest time, but so has everything else. So it's not just the theater that has this problem, though. I must say, everyone thinks, oh, the theater is so liberal. And in fact, it's not. Um, and uh, Carol and I know from the early days of the women's movement, I mean, when I was directing uh, in the 70s and 80s, I was often the first woman ever to direct on a stage I was directing on. I was often the only woman ever to have had a play written by a woman on the stage. I mean, this was just the way it was. And um, certainly that was true for people of color as well. So. Um, it was a big deal when I, I mean, the first time I ever directed on the Guthrie main stage was man, first woman to direct on Guthrie. <laughs> so, I mean, that was the early, you know, it was 79, 80. Um, same thing when I took here, uh, uh, when I was in, uh, um, the artistic director uh, in 1990, man, first woman to you know, uh, lead McCarter Theater. I mean, it's it just such nonsense, you know. They loved making that little joke all the time. So that's why it sticks in my head. It's very recent that you begin to see women, though they founded the not-for-profit theater movement, if they didn't found yes. their own theaters, they didn't run a theater and they often weren't directing there. Um, for people of color, it was even worse, men and women. Um, and now you're seeing the numbers slightly shift. And we'll see when the numbers come out now with the reopening, now that people have had to think deeply about this. They have been challenged by We See You White America and the different um, producing groups that are now getting together as black producers. What how, you know, what, how will these numbers change in actual productions, who is being heard and seen. And I think we're going to see a shift. And every single union and guild I'm part of, or focus group I've been part of, there isn't anyone who hasn't thought about it who's a major player in the business. Some of them are like, I don't want to have anything to do with it. But they're in the minority. Most of them know they have to. Some of them are doing it because they want to, but a majority between the I want to and I have to, it's a big majority. So I think we're going to see a shift uh, coming out of the pandemic. And I'm hoping it isn't just a short blip and then it goes back to business as usual. I'm hoping that it's gone deep enough. I think it might have just because people are setting up systems now. They know they can't have an all white office, for example. They know they can't have an all white backstage. Now, whether the commercial people are gonna be able to make a change, it's gonna depend a lot on the unions. And I'm talking about not equity and not the stage directors and choreographers, but the Teamsters. I mean, local one is you know, everyone gets grandfathered into that. It's been an all white, all male bastion for a very, for what is it, 80, 100 years. I mean, the, these systems weren't built in a day and they won't be dismantled in a day, but I think there are little chinks. They know that's not gonna fly much longer. They're gonna have to, they're gonna have to change too. So I'm hopeful. Something I wonder about is there's been a common refrain that, I, you know, I want to see people like me on stage, in films, in on television. And I, I understand that. I mean, 
uh, I could state it personally, you know, all the, all the parodies of femaleness or whatever, or white femaleness. But I worry that, well, I understand that. I, I respect that. I think we need a diversity of stories. But what about entering someone else's story, right? I want to see the lives of people who are actually not like me, right? Or whose lives may converge with mine in ways that I had little knowledge of. So I'm worried a, a little bit, you know, how are we gonna solve this representational problem? And there's been, you know, you, you can only write a story about uh, 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 a Native American, if you're Native American, and actually wanting to enter, telling your own stories. I think that's good, but I also know there are incredible, um, you know, historians and playwrights who are writing stories of other people as well as their own people. Uh, absolutely. I think is essential to a healthy environment. I couldn't agree with you more, Carol. I mean, this is one of the things that makes me the saddest, but it isn't as if we haven't seen this before. Remember, we we saw it also in the 60s and 70s. Of, you know, appropriation is not a new term. Um, but yeah. I remember um, having a panel with Entozaki, Shange, Jelani Davis, Athel Fugard, Joyce Carol Oates, a whole bunch of wonderful writers. And, um, and Joyce brought that up. She said, you know, I write a lot about black people and I worry. And Tulani said, you write about it very well. And that's the difference. And then Athel said, what I think, you know, the absurdity would be that I can only write about an Africana, South African, straight male. Right. That means I'm not an artist. The, the mark of an artist, is you're only limited by your imagination or lack thereof. And I totally believe that. So, but I think we're gonna to have to go through the pendulum swinging a little too far to come back mm -hmm. because it is an absurdity for artists to say that to each other because in fact, it is about imagination. And I'm like you, I don't go to the theater to see me or anyone like me. I go to the theater to learn about someone who doesn't either look like me or act like me or have my background. I want to learn, I'm curious about other people. Now I get to say that because I, I you know, there are more people who look like me or, or perhaps have more of my background on stage um, than some of the other people we're talking about. So once there are, is more diversity on the stage where people can go and see themselves, then I think this is gonna loosen up. I really do, because at the end of the day, I think people want to see stories of people that the stories they don't know, not just the stories they do know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The story that they haven't heard told. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Emily, um, but also as a, as a personal question, when did you find out as a when you growing up that theater would help you to create meaning in life or that it made sense to you. Tell us a bit about your story. Huh. Well, I didn't grow up going to the theater. The first piece of theater I saw was my father had written the biography of Fiorello H. LaGuardia. And there was a musical called Fiorello and they'd used his book. So he was invited to go and we went from uh, Northampton, Massachusetts. My father taught at Smith College because he believed in the education of women. And so off we trundled as a little girl um, to Broadway and I really loved it. And I listened to that album all the time. I knew every word and we got to go backstage and meet Tom Bosley who was re you know, playing LaGuardia and I was thrilled. Um, but it never occurred to me that was something that a, you know, a serious person did because in our house, you had to be a serious person and you had to make the world a better place and you had to think about what you believed in. And so that was entertainment and entertainment was great, but I didn't think that was you know, my, going to be my life struggle. So it was high school, we moved to Chicago. John Hope Franklin um, actually had recruited my father to University of Chicago and was at the lab school, which was a great progressive experimental school. And there was a theater department. And basically I got a crush on a boy who 
was in uh, the theater. And so I, I went up to watch a rehearsal one day and I remember he was in, um, he was playing No Good Boyo in um, Under Milkwood. And I thought he was really wonderful. And then I was told that, you know, if you worked on the play, you could go to the cast party. So I worked on the play and I became enchanted with theater. And I mean, I, I thought theater was musicals. I didn't understand. So here was this beautiful, beautiful poetic piece. And I, I, I thought I was going to be a, a novelist or an English teacher, or, you know, or I was going to, you know, be a social worker. I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, but this was just uh, captivating. And I was also a musician and there was music in it. And so I, the crush show disappeared, but they just, I fell madly in love with the form, with the theater. And I started going from sweeping floors to doing makeup, to doing props, to finally acting. And I acted for quite a while. And then my junior year in high school, this wonderful drama teacher said, you see the whole play. I think you think like a director. And he told me to direct. So I started directing, everything came together. My love of literature and music and visual art and um, uh, interpreting. I, I loved, uh, I was a French, I, 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 my French was very good. And I loved something called explication du texte, which was, you know, when you, when you really take apart almost word for word, which is what you do with actors, you know, um, a, a text. Um, it, it all just came together for me. And I thought, oh, this is, this is what I love. I had no idea you can make uh, a life out of it. I had no idea you can make a living in, in the theater. But um, as I got more and more into it, um, and then uh, went to college um, at Harvard, at, at Radcliffe, I then um, found myself that was an English major, I spent all my time at the Loeb making theater. I was acting, I was directing. And then William Alfred, who was a, a great teacher at Harvard, and he was also Chris Durang's teacher. Um, he gave, there was no drama department there. Um, he, he gave one seminar in playwriting and I took it. And I was the only freshman he let in and I started writing. And that's when I met Chris and that's when I, he was gonna go off to Yale drama school. And I suddenly began to be aware of the theater as a profession. And he was writing these, you know, wild, brilliant, he, he was Chris Durang even then. <laughs> and I realized, oh my God, you can, it's, it's, a, it's a world I didn't know. And then I began to read about it. And then my father gave me a book about Hallie Flanagan and said, you know, you can make a difference on a lot of levels in the theater. I've been, I've been researching this for you. And suddenly. Well, you know, the University of Chicago, I, I grew up in Homewood, Flossmoor, Illinois. Oh, sure. And my grandmother lived in Hyde Park, which is where the University of Chicago. That's where I was. And, um, but you know, early life was in a, a town called Park Forest which was one of the first towns in the United States, I think, to say, openly say, we'll have no covenant laws. All, anyone of any religion can live here. And then, and there were a lot of former uh, uh, war veterans, but not all, my father was not a war veteran. And then 10 years later, they said, and anyone of any race can also live here. So the ambiance of that definitely was profound and stayed with me, but also University of Chicago was, you know, kind of wonderful and had people from all over the world. All over the world. On campus. And that was when we visited my grandmother, eye-opening. And, yeah. and also like your town, one of the only integrated neighborhoods, not only in Chicago, but in the country. Yes. There were yeah, yeah. couples and people went to school together and had relationships and friendships and you know that's how I thought the world was going to be exactly exactly yeah I was formed there yeah yeah 
So it was a formidable place, yes. Formidable place. Mm -hmm. And the late 60s, I was there, you know, with the, you know, the weathermen and SDS and, and the Nation of Islam, Elijah Muhammad lived th three doors down from us. Um, and this was a cauldron, you know, in the Black Panther Party. And so I became very radicalized when I was there in the, in the late 60s. Yeah. yeah, it was an amazing place. It's interesting that you had a similar a similar experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just the ambiance was extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, and it had been for a number of years, many years actually. Mm -hmm. So, and <clears throat> Emily, you would say the moment we are in at the right now, you say this is comparable. Something will switch. Something will turn. Or you say it's a perhaps there's a more positive outlook. But you feel well. How would you compare those two? Well, it was, there was a real um, revolution for women's rights. It was women's rights, uh, civil rights, and um, I, I, and it was, you know, the anti-war movement as well. But it created a huge, it was a tectonic shift in American life at that point. I think the women's movement uh, was in some ways went the furthest. And then uh, civil rights movement went very far and then stalled. And then the women's movement stalled too. But I mean, um, but yes, huge shifts happened um, at that time. And um, I think the same thing is happening again, um, 50 years later. We do seem to go in 50 year cycles in this country. And, and I do think we're in another tectonic shift, yeah. And I'm hoping as successful as the last one was, or more successful, more successful. But we couldn't have come this far without that previous one. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Carolyn? I agree. I mean, I think of it as um, uh, the women's movement really building upon the civil rights movement of the 50s. Yes. And that creates a, a lot of um, ideas in the 60s you know, and uh, female writers with whom I've also been deeply concerned. Um, uh, you know, Adrian Kennedy, there's just a, a huge sudden growth of female writers that begin in the, in the 60s. Um, there are great antecedents for that. There's actually lots of plays by black female writers about lynching, anti-lynching plays. Um, so yeah, the, the 60s was this kind of amalgamation of, of different movements of, of um, yeah, civil rights, feminism. But then, you know, one of the things that happens of, of pride, gay and lesbian rights, there's a, a play called uh, Stonewall written in the early 70s um, in which, uh, yeah, the, the performers in that particular play were afraid of being identified as being lesbian or gay, of having the, being in the play shape their identity because the movement was very young and there was a lot of uncertainty in the air. Um, but then I think a certain kind of corporatism takes over. The 80s. Yeah, the, the late 70s, 80s. Corporatism and postmodernism, which, which really makes things dysfunctional and, and empties out a kind of political motivation and advocacy in certain ways. Agreed. Uh, uh, but does, does grow uh, significant kinds of theory that can help us out today. But today, again, there's, you know, there's a lot of different movements, the reemergence of the women's movement um, with Me Too in, in ways that have been mind blowing uh, yes. across, across, you know, from local theaters to film and television um, and, and the environment again. And we had the environmental movement earlier, right? right? So there's, there's, a, there's like a bundle and a mm -hmm. happening. And I think that that's good. I think, I, I think what we've learned from the pandemic is that it really matters. Everything really matters. What we do environmentally, how we treat one another, what we do, you know, within the theater, 
within the institutional structures of theater, within the institutional structures of education. I'd like to see education improve. Um, we all have our own stories uh, about our institutional familiarity. Mm -hmm. You know, the functionality of it all is, um, is a, you know, on the front burner again. Yeah. And there's also was an anti-capitalist um, uh, strain in, in, in much of what went on in the late 60s. And it's, it's back in, in new forms, yeah. uh, which is, is interesting and, and exciting because you even have the idea. I mean, as, as a European, Frank, I think you might find this amusing. But when you, when you talk about um, democratic socialism in this country, it, it can be a, a buzzword for terror. Um, uh, as soon as you hear the word socialist, um, uh, <clears throat> half the country, their hair is on fire. Um, mm -hmm. But that, that's becoming a term to actually discuss again is uh, interesting and hopeful. Uh, we'll see how far uh, that can go since we have an absolutely dysfunctional health system and, and um, uh, and, and social welfare system. So it's, um, I think it's a very exciting time. Um, mm -hmm. When I, I, on my stronger days, <laughs> when I don't let the yeah. fear of what could happen get the better yeah. of me. It is hopeful. And we had, you know, that these reports from Chile, you know, just two weeks ago where this election happened, the constitution will be rewritten by 141 delegates. It, came out of the big Women's Day uh, march. Over a million women uh, came together. Then teenagers refused to, to, uh, the, to accept the payment rise for, for, for subway tickets. And they went on the streets and it was a huge success. So there are, it's, I don't wonder why this is not more reported. It's the end of the Pinochet era in some certain way. So there are hopeful things coming out. And, and I hope uh, that we will use those words again that seem to be banned. And, um, and it's a great Isaiah Berlin said, you know, I am on the extreme right of the absolute extreme left. And, uh, <laughs> and, and that's a good place to be. And uh, uh, so, um, so we should really think, you know, and we, these demarcation lines are, are um, renegotiated now in a good yeah. way. And that we all have to do something. That's a very big difference, you know, also was not enough to show on stage how what's wrong with the world. We not only have to show alternatives what could what is thinkable on stage could happen in real life a model that's why theater is so great that's also why it's censored because it does what but now also it's time to do something and to say you know participate have a participation we are coming closer to the end and i'm really sorry maybe we, maybe we should have a part two it was you know so important like sorry perlock you know to hear from leaders uh, female leaders in the in the in the country, you know, about such a, long, such a long uh, uh, history. And we need to know more. We also listen carefully um, what, what, what the experience really were. And yours was so important that great David Goddard from the Riverside Studio where there was the uh, Tarkovsky and the Cantor and uh, Beckett rehearsed and everybody came. He invited you early on. You were a voice that also traveled across the oceans early on. And, um, Mm -hmm. And there are very few of them. So this is really all our respect for your work. As a last question, what did inspire you in this time? What did you listen to music? What did you read or what films or people discussion? What in that search, I guess we all had, you said we went inside, we connected to our inner world, which is important. And mm -hmm. Carl Jung said, the big problem is that so much is from the outside comes into us. We lost that. We need to connect the dreams are you know, immediate, no one has seen it before, you create them yourself. So, but what did you, what was inspiring for you? What did you, what did you follow? What gave you, what kept you warm and sharpened your knives? Uh, well, that's so interesting. Um, my personal life came in balance. I'm, I'm, I work so hard. I had been overworked for 30 years and suddenly I was in my home I realized I hadn't really lived in my home. I woke up, had a slug of coffee and ran to the theater. Um, I, another grandchild was born. And suddenly all of this, with all the horror and death going on outside, here was this new life. 
And I found myself absolutely besotted by her and making her promises that I was going to help her enter a better world and um, whispering in her ear the way my mother whispered in mine, which was, we need you to make a better place. <laughs> and we're counting on you and your energy and your intelligence, my dear little girl, to, to do what you can to save to save, the, to, to save humanity when I mean, we're facing extinction. It's very simple to a, the, the hope of having the, an infant in your arms at a point when you realize that the planet is so endangered, not necessarily as a planet, but for human being a, beings being able to live on it, that facing extinction as a species, this next generation is so key. So I began to really look in terms of what my priorities were, how much it had to do with family, how much it had to do with writing and making a contribution with something that could last and possibly be teaching tools. So when I started working on The Pianist, I wondered, do people still need to hear this? And then as I was writing it before um, the election, and I realized how fast fascism can rise, which is really what the pianist is about, how, how it happens so fast before you're able to get out and protect yourself. The, these, the, the lessons that I've learned from, you know, the blood memory, but also from my, the, 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 the teachers and mentors before me, what I want to pass down, that became very clear to me, not to teach fear, but to, my mother once said to me, when you hear them, when you, you, when you hear them say something, listen, they may be telling you the truth, your enemies. It's just not, people were laughing at Hitler for too long. He looked like Charlie Chaplin. He told us what he was going to do and he did it. Trump told us what he was going to do and he's done it all along the line. Believe him, you hear it, believe it. And then what are you going to do about it? So these small um, kernels of wisdom, you know, I just want to, they became more and more precious to me as I began to, to clear away the clutter of overwork and really start deeply listening. I also, during the pandemic, reconnected to the people that mean the most to me and that I love, but also the people whom I've learned the most from. So I started, Gloria Steinem and I began again talking regularly, you know, and, and there are many other people who are not as famous as Gloria, but, you know, who are dear to me and are uh, figures that I think of as sometimes being very wise. And I realized who really meant a lot to me. So this simplification was the biggest lesson I learned and the prioritizing of people um, to learn from. And then I won't tell you the series, the TV series that I caught up on and that I love. Why not? Tell us. <laughs> what is Emily? Well, Miller? seen a French village. Did you yeah. see a French village? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I adored it. Yeah. I, I just found it extraordinary. And I started to... Um, uh, I get very, uh, very involved in the long form, um, a place to call home and uh, lots and Borg and, and somehow seeing drama at the length of a novel became yes. extremely interesting to me. So long form writing and how you get to really know these characters and have watched them going through time just fascinated me because I had never, I was always in the theater. I never had time to watch these things. And I'm, I'm hooked on the long form. Um, so. Well, maybe you'll do a Queensboro TV series and you direct it uh, and write it. Why not? You know, it's an important theme and uh, it's a new way, a different way of telling it. We'll see, um, Emily, really, um, thank you so much for sharing and, uh, and Carol for being with us and also, you know, for pointing to, towards um, the work of Emily. And it is significant, it is important. 
And it has really has made a difference. And I think you are absolutely right. I think that's quite an image. And I will keep that in my mind when you, you hold your granddaughter in your arms and having just visited the great grandmother's grave and the planet, as you say, is facing extinction, extinction for the human species. And it's true, it'd be our survival is endangered like never before. And the question is how much can we really tolerate a lot, but what, what is no longer tolerable? And how, what do we do in this moment? Bus tune, what to do? And, um, and I think uh, you, what you do in your, your life and your work and artistic expression and also as a center of a community is important as a big model for all of us. And we all have to think in that way you do. And it is uh, quite stunning to hear also from you to say this moment we are in is as significant as shifting tectonically as the 60s. And we should be part of it and we should be actively part of it and um, something will happen with or without us. So it's better to be part of it. So thank you, Emily. Thank you, Carol, for being here with all your expertise and, uh, and um, also following up our great talk um, on last week. I had a little sound problem for the first time, but I bought a new computer. Hopefully it worked today um, and better. So thank you all. And uh, tomorrow for um, the closing um, of the week, we have the two young curators, um, in Berlin, from Berlin, who, as every Berliner now, is actually not from Berlin, is Joanna Varsavarsva. She's a curator. And together with Ovul Dormugosolu, a Turkish curator, they created what they call Die Balkone, the Balconies, artists in Prenzlauer Berg neighborhood, created work, a festival of art produced on the balconies for the people in the street. They did two editions, very successful, very interesting work. Um, we haven't seen that here. Uh, and so we're going to. Um, listen um, a bit uh, about that next week. If all goes well, we will hear from a French uh, a writer, a French African writer. We will hear from uh, uh, um, puppetry and social practice. What is changing? The puppetry community, it was Claudia Ornstein as it was leading it, you know, is changing and has an increased awareness and continuing what they always did. And if all works out, and we hope we'll have the great Pina Bausch dance company with us, you know, Pina died. Um, they know that everything was shut down. What does it mean for a company like hers? And uh, Emily can understand what that really means. And uh, so we hopefully get an update also from that. So we continue our talk to you. Thank you all for listening. Thanks to HowlRound for being such a great host, but mostly to our listeners. And again, you know, what Emily says is, well, is meaningful to all of us and for our lives. And not only when we talk about theater, how it has to diversify, we have to reach out. We should diversify our lives, invite people, be open, meet people. So what artists do is representative for something. And they are on the right side of justice, on the right side of freedom as Emily, and the fight for freedoms, Emily was on that all her life. And if people would have listened to her, this country would be a much better place. So we have to be uh, take it very serious at what artists see, not just look at it, but also try how can we adapt our lives to these uh, things. And so as, as, as Carol said, you know, the movements of, uh, of feminism, of uh, civil rights uh, uh, struggles, they uh, have a history, they have a present, but they also have a future. And uh, we, in theater, but also in our own lives, have to be part of it. So thank you all. And thanks to uh, HowlRound again, Andy, BJ, and uh, Thea, and um, I hope Emily and Carol to see you all both in person soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Thank you.